Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, first, it's for Neil Weiner. It's nice to be here in this series. She spoke in this series four or five years ago as well. Um, but I wanted to start with nothing related to my talk, which is I started here. I'll tell you a quick story. It's sort of about the Vera way of thinking about the world. Uh, when I was finishing my PhD at Yale, uh, I, um, uh, because of family reasons, I need to get a job. I need money to live. So I, uh, 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 one of my mentors, Stan Wheeler, said, well, why don't you go to Vera in New York? And he called up Vera and they invited me. And they had a program at the time developing on community policing. It was one of the first community policing programs. It was 1985, quite early. I was about 10 years old at the time. So um, I went here and I met Sally Hillsman, who was at the time, I forget the title, she was like the vice president and uh, Jerry McElroy, they were sort of co-chairs of the research division. And I really enjoyed meeting them and I thought this was gonna be great. And, you know, you have that, I don't know how you make decisions, but you know, you get that sense in your stomach kinda, uh, this, this could be like a lot of fun. They told me what I was gonna be doing, which is walking the street with cops five days a week. Now having spent the previous four years in a computer center at Yale for two in the morning every night. I thought this could be something fun to do. So I called up a, a colleague, uh, my wife's family from Israel, and she wanted to, us to go back to Israel. And um, I, I called a colleague there and I said, well, you know, I'm finishing my PhD and uh, I'm going to be, I've got this opportunity to go to Vera and it would solve some financial issues for me. And boy, it sounds like fun and I'd learn a lot by walking the street with cops. And he said to me, and you know, in a very positive way, not being trying to be mean, he said, well, if you do that, I don't know what's gonna happen. That kind of work, you know, you're from Yale and Ivory Tower, now you're gonna go to the street with cops and Vera and like, what is that about? Now, uh, it's ridiculous, right? <laughs> if you think about it. But the, uh, at the time, there was a kind of atmosphere that, you know, there were the academics from elite institutions, and they would, you know, stay away from the real world, sort of do things. Being in the computer center was a better idea, if you like. And uh, uh, having uh, contact with that is not going to help you. Now, the reason I put this up is because when I, when I received the Stockholm Prize in chronology in uh, uh, 2015, uh, 2010, actually, I, uh, I got up and I did my first slide had this on it, which was, all I ever really needed to know, I learned in the 72nd precinct, and I talked about the Beer Institute study that I came to. Uh, because Beer at the time, and I hope still, emphasized the importance of this interaction between the real world of criminal justice and the sort of theoretical, statistical evaluation world, and how those things need to be tightly linked. And uh, that's what I got when I came to Beer. I learned about the real world, and indeed, I'm not talking about it today, but some of the primary contributions I made in research had to do with things I learned in the 72nd precinct uh, working for Vera then. So this model, they called it action research at the time, but this model of being sort of invested, involved in the real world, care about the real world, is something I got in Vera. And I think that the Vera idea has won, so to speak. In other words, that comment that I heard uh, a long time ago probably wouldn't be stated to you guys who are younger who are looking for a job. People would be saying, we often ask if you ever been out there? Do you know something about the real world, etc.? cetera? Uh, so, and I took this, paraphrase this, by the way, from a book, I don't know if you remember, All I Ever Really Needed to Know, I Learned in Kindergarten, I think that was the title. Anyway, so I'm very appreciative of the Vera Institute, and I'm very much uh, committed to the idea, though I'm very invested in basic research as well, of the idea of making sure you're being realistic to the world you operate in. But that's not what I'm gonna talk about today. What I talked about today is, Proactive policing and crime control. Uh, uh, I'm going to talk about a National Academy of Sciences committee uh, that I chaired that published their report a few months ago. So I've added to my usual slide the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. So let me tell you uh, where I'm going. Um, the uh, well, I, I can't help but tell you a joke about Oliver Wendell Holmes. Not a joke. When I was in uh, Washington, I went to, uh, a federal judge came to me and said, uh, 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 told me a story about Holmes. I'm sure you know Holmes was Associate Justice of the Supreme Court. And uh, he said, the story goes that Holmes, who was quite forgetful and quite distinctive looking, that he was on a train leaving Washington 
and a conductor came up to him and asked him for his ticket. And Holmes started looking here and there. They couldn't find it. And the guy said, all of a sudden noticed who he was, saw it was Justice Holmes and said, uh, Justice Holmes, don't worry, just send the ticket to the railway company uh, when you find it. And Holmes said to him, a young man, the problem is not where is my ticket, it's where am I going? So when I like, when I start out a talk, I like to give you a sense of, of where I'm gonna be proceeding. Uh, first, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the National Academy of Sciences Committee itself. Uh, I'm gonna tell you how we define proactive policing and the typology of proactive policing that we developed. I'm also gonna tell you a little bit about what a report is, because to some extent, many things I'm gonna tell you are not my ideas. They're a consensus report of a group of people that came together to look at this problem. I'm then gonna tell you about the conclusions. I'm gonna focus on conclusions about uh, crime control and conclusions about community impacts. Uh, in the report, we also had a chapter on law. If you wanna ask me about that, I'm happy to talk about it. I'm not gonna talk much about it today, Indeed, uh, as I'll probably note towards the end, uh, there was not that much, at least, evaluation, social science evidence about legal issues. But nonetheless, I think the chapter is worthwhile, but not the topic today. I'm also gonna give you some cautions because the evidence base has some limitations to it uh, more generally that I think you have to keep in mind. It's also opportunities for what you could do to try to improve that evidence base, uh, make it uh, stronger. Um, I'm going to say something about race, but not very much, because race is obviously a community impact. It's a very important issue at the moment. But you'll see how uh, the state of research about racial issues uh, related to proactive policing is very weak, and I'll say something about that. And then I'm going to depart at the end, just for a short bit. And I'm going to give you a sort of take of my own, which is not in the report itself. Now, I have to say that, because if I say, if I speak as a representative of the National Academy of Sciences, I can't say these kinds of things, but if I say that I'm going to tell you something now that I think, beyond the report, uh, it's okay. All right, so let me first tell you about the, um, about the report itself. I'm not sure you're aware of how the National Academy of Sciences works in terms of uh, its uh, efforts to inform the government. Uh, the National Academy of Sciences was established uh, uh, 150 years ago, I believe, uh, during the Civil War by Abraham Lincoln. Uh, the, at least the, uh, the Bubba Maitha, the uh, story your grandparents tell you about it, is that Lincoln wanted to figure out how to get compasses to work on ironclad ships. In the Civil War, they built these ships. They looked like submarines. They weren't, but they were made out of iron, and they couldn't get compasses to work. And he said, I'm going to bring together the great minds of the Union and have them inform the government about how we could solve this problem. So the National Academy of Sciences and the National Research Council, which uh, 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 developed these policy-related uh, pieces, uh, they're there to help inform the government. The government does not support the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, it's not part of the government in that way, but it was established by the federal government. And there are special mechanisms for funding the National Academy of Sciences, which is one of the ways that they uh, develop their work. In this case, there were two funders. One was a federal funder, the National Institute of Justice, and the second was a private foundation, uh, Laura and John Arnold, uh, uh, and John Arnold Foundation. Uh, Jeremy Travis is now the research director, not the research director, the senior vice president, senior vice president uh, at Arnold. Uh, they are probably funding as much or more research in crime and crime-related issues as the federal government at the moment. The study began in uh, August 2015. Uh, the study committee, what happens is you form a committee, and I'll show you that committee in a minute, of uh, scholars in the field and scholars also, if you like, from outside the field. Uh, we held six meetings. Those people worked between those six meetings. Uh, and we reached a consensus report. Now, uh, I want to emphasize this idea of a consensus report. It means that everybody, every name I'm going to show you, all those people agreed to all the conclusions we reached. If they didn't, they would write a, uh, uh, they, they had a chance to write not a rebuttal, but a dissent, if you like. And in that dissent, they could state what exactly they dissented to and uh, uh, why. The, uh, in this report, uh, there is no dissent. It's a consensus report. Uh, the National Academy of Sciences likes a consensus report. And the reason is because they only want to inform the government 
when there is a broad consensus. They're not looking to give some new cutting edge idea. Uh, they're looking to summarize what the evidence says, and they want to know that lots of people from different perspectives will agree to that. Uh, that makes the, what we agree to, I think, in some ways more important, or at least uh, uh, has greater weight. It does make it a lot more difficult uh, to do this. If you're asked to chair a National Academy of Sciences panel, I would suggest you think about the pain and suffering that goes into getting a group of, someone say, herding cats or something, you know, getting a group of academics together. I should note there were two uh, practitioners on the panel as well. Uh, the report was peer reviewed and quite heavily peer reviewed. So let me, these are the names. I don't know if you can see them. Uh, I'm the chair. Uh, Hassan Aden is a practitioner, a very innovative uh, uh, police chief who is not a police chief anymore because that's a conflict of interest uh, uh, with their department. Uh, Anthony Braga from Northeastern University, Jim Bierman, who is the president of the Police Foundation, uh, Phil Cook, who's an economist from Duke University, uh, uh, Phil Goff, who's here at uh, John Jay, um, Rachel Harmon, uh, and a psychologist, Rachel Harmon from the Virginia uh, Law School, University of Virginia Law School, Amelia Havlin, who's a statistician from Carnegie Mellon, Cynthia Lum from George Mason University, uh, Charles Mansky, a statistician from Northeastern University, Steve Mastrovsky from George Mason University, Tracy Miras, a uh, law professor from uh, Yale, uh, Dan Nagin, an economist and criminologist from Carnegie Mellon, Emily Owens, an economist who's now at Irvine, uh, Steve Raphael, an economist from Berkeley, uh, Jerry Radcliffe, a criminologist from Temple, and Tom Tyler, who's in psychology and law at Yale. Now, if you know these people, this is a very broad group of people who work in a bunch of different areas uh, and who are known for having, some of them for having positions, which will be interesting in terms of the conclusions. Think of what they've written and the conclusions we've reached. Now, once you've written this report and pain and suffering through getting all these people to agree on a 300 or 400 page text, and by the way, the report is uh, downloadable free on the National Academy of Sciences website. You can order a report in hardcover. You don't have to pay for that. Uh, but the, uh, the report is downloadable for free. Uh, but, and then after you're done, you send it to review. Now, the reviewers are also quite a diverse group, as you can see. Uh, Bob Crutchfield, sociology from the University of Washington. John uh, 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 DeVito, uh, DeVito from uh, Yale. Lorraine Maserell, John Pepper. Uh, Ruth Peterson from Ohio State, sociologist. Donald Platt from Rockefeller University. Sue Rare, who's a uh, police practitioner. And Nancy Ride uh, from Toronto, Jennifer Richardson, Rob Sampson, uh, uh, Lawrence Sherman from Cambridge, Wes Scogan from Northwestern, who chaired the previous Policing National Academy of Sciences panel in 2004. Um, uh, Christopher, I don't know, you can't read his name from here. Christopher Scobigan, Dennis Stevens, David Williams. My point is to give you a sense of the rigor, if you like, uh, and, and it is a lot of rigor because all these people wrote five or 10 pages reviews and we had to respond to them. And then it got reviewed again to make sure that our responses were sufficient. In any event, that should give you a sense of why when you get a conclusion from a National Academy of Sciences report, you probably want to think about it. In other words, at least a broad group of people and a broad group of reviewers have sort of vetted this as not just someone getting up and giving an interview and saying what they think, but rather something that's based on science. And that's another important issue to realize that the National Academy of Sciences committees are not places to sort of think out issues. They're places to think about what the evidence says, which also has its limitations, but it's important to recognize those at the outset. Okay, so what did our panel define as proactive policing? Because you think about it, people use the term all the time, but they often use it differently. So this is our term. All policing strategies that have one of their goals, the prevention or reduction of crime and disorder, and they're not reactive in terms of focusing primarily on uncovering ongoing crime or on investigating and responding to crimes once they've occurred. Now, proactive policing in this definition is not about individual officers who are proactive. So let's sort of put that to the side, and that's an important idea. Indeed, when the idea of proactivity was developed, uh, by Al Reese, 
uh, back in the 1960s. He was talking more about individual behavior, but our report talks about organizational strategy. A department makes a decision to be proactive. That's the way to think about how we thought about the problem. Now, proactive policing we thought of as distinguished from an idea that was raised in the 2004 National Academy of Sciences report on policing. And I actually, uh, uh, myself and John Eck, we developed uh, this comparison in that report. The, uh, uh, and we called it the standard model, the model that police departments use throughout the country. They emphasize on reacting to particular crime events after they occurred. Someone calls you and says, send someone. And that's important in American policing, by the way. It's still the dominant feature of American policing. But that's the standard model of policing. You call me, I respond to a, an event. And I respond to that event. Uh, you mobilize resources based on the outsiders asking for help. Citizens call. Maybe your community council people call. You don't sort of have your own a uh, strategic approach to how I can, what I can do about crime and other problems. And you focus on incidents. Of course, Herman Goldstein, who this year received the Stockholm Prize in Criminology, he criticized this aspect of policing many, many years ago, that you see each individual event and you don't pick, put them together. When I, that a study I did for Vera uh, 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 in the mid-1980s, uh, one of the first things that struck me was I spoke to one of the officers and I was asking them, why do you, why did you do this? Why did you want to volunteer for this job of a new community policing program? He told me a story that he had responded to a police call and her address in Brooklyn was in the 72nd precinct. And uh, he got there and there were these three kids and they were all beat by their parents, by the father. And it was, he was horrified, right? This young guy must've been in his twenties. He was horrified like, you know, this, my God, Right, you know, you think the police is getting, uh, you know, they get hardened, so to speak. But this was really affected him, and he he sit there and he wrote things up and he called social service and he waited and he got in trouble with the sergeant because what are you supposed to do when you close something out? You're supposed to go somewhere else. And he promised them these kids. He says, I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure that this doesn't happen. He told the father probably in a not nice way about what will happen to him anyway. Three months later. And he read in the, in the post that they saw pictures of these kids strung up in their basement. So uh, he said, I want to be able to follow up. I want to be able, if there's a problem, to come to it afterwards. But that idea of policing, the standard model was we keep sending people to deal with particular incidents. We don't necessarily come together or think through how those incidents are connected. We don't necessarily follow up. That's not our job. Now, I don't want to say a lot about this, but the product of policing from the report's perspective uh, developed really from a crisis in confidence in the police that developed in the 1960s. And that confidence had two components to it. People generally, the police often think of one component, but one component was that there was growing evidence that the standard model of policing didn't do anything. Herman Goldstein was a major person in writing about this, that it didn't reduce crime. The police thought it reduced crime, but as David Bailey said, that's a myth. These kinds of get there faster response incidents, by the way, they're very important to do and the public expects the police to do them, but they're not necessarily going to uh, result in reduced crime. So one of these crises was a sense crime rates were going up. You, those you young people won't remember New York in the 1980s. It was a different place, so it had a different feel to it. There was a lot of crime here. The murder rate was, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, 3,000 a year or something. Now I think it's 200 or 300, I don't know. But the point is, the things were, were scary. So crime was one element, but there was another element, the race riot, uh, bad relations between police and communities. That also created a crisis. And that led to the development of many of the proactive policing strategies that we looked at. Uh, some of them, by the way, focused mostly on crime, and some of them actually focused on community. Now, another thing we uh, concluded in the report, and I encourage you to read the report, I think it's really interesting. You get this sort of broad view of the world of policing as well. There's a chapter on the history of proactive policing. One thing we get out of it, until that period, you don't really have much proactive policing in the way we're thinking about it in the United States. Does it exist in Berkeley, for example, with Vollmer uh, in the 1920s and 30s? Yes, there's some of this going on, but overall proactive policing in America 
as we think about it today, sort of organizational strategies to do something about crime or other problems, uh, that doesn't really emerge uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a major way until the 1980s, until the mid and late 1980s. When I came to Vera in 1985, that was part of that change in policing. Okay, so some of the, for some of you, this might be very repetition, you don't need it, but for others, you may. So we have it in the report, we created a typology. We wanted to think about the different types of strategies. And that typology worked in the following way. There were place-based uh, approaches. The logic model of those approaches was that crime concentrates in a very small number of places in the city. If you know my work, you know about 5% of the streets in New York, Seattle, Tel Aviv, and other places produce 50% of the crime. 1% of the streets produces 25% of the crime. So if that's true, maybe the police sort of think where that occurs and what we can do about it. A second type of proactive policing is problem solving. In this case, really responds to that officer who you know, couldn't follow up, et cetera. What you do is you try to not think in terms of events. You try to think in terms of the connection of events. How can I solve problems? What is the problem leading to those events? A third is person-focused policing. Like uh, uh, place-focused policing, there's a lot of evidence over the last 30 or 40 years that a lot of the crime is committed by a relatively small group of people, especially the more serious violent crime. And there have been a group of strategies that have developed capitalizing on that. What happens if we focus on the most violent offenders? Will that allow us to do something about the crime problem? Because they're committing a lot of uh, the crime. And finally, there's community-based approaches. And those approaches, uh, though many of them began with the idea of connecting with the community, they interconnected with the idea of crime control and improving communities as well. And these uh, approaches capitalized on the idea of much of policing is dependent on people in the community. If the people don't cooperate with you, there's not much you can do. Who calls the police? Who tells you about crime? There's been a decline in the clearance rates for murder. In many cities. Well, one reason may be that people may be in this particular period in America, where people, many people feel alienated from the police, that they're less likely to call. So there are a bunch of strategies that develop that are about improving the police relationship with the community, about helping them in a sense, or at least uh, uh, creating an atmosphere where the police and the community work together more strongly. Now, what are the strategies of these approaches? You probably know all of this. For place-based policing, you have hotspots policing, predictive policing, CCTV, the cameras. For problem solving, you have problem-oriented policing, an innovation called third-party policing. For person-focused uh, 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 approaches, you have focused deterrence, a repeat offender program, stop, question, and frisk, which in New York you obviously know a lot about. Uh, Community-based approaches, you have community-oriented policing, procedural justice policing, and broken windows policing. The reason we put broken windows policing here, by the way, is because in its theory, at least, broken windows policing is about helping the community to regain its confidence, to be less fearful. We focus on the broken windows, those uh, problems that exist out there, so people in the community will be willing to go outside, will feel that there's some control out there in the community. Even though broken windows often, especially in the case of zero tolerance, became more like if you like focused deterrence and SQF and things of this sort. Okay, uh, now each of these approaches in our view had an objective and a way to accomplish them. Uh, Place-based approaches, their objective was they want to prevent crime in micro-geographic places and single streets or small groups of streets. Uh, these studies often identify hotspots and do something about them. This is an approach that uh, Bill Bratton adopted very early on and continues in New York. Uh, problem solving approaches, they're trying to solve problems, not just respond to incidents. You scan and analyze problems, you identify solutions and you assess them. The SARA model developed uh, by John Eck and Bill Spellman uh, is a very important example of that. In person focused approaches, you want to identify those high rate offenders. A lot of these approaches use data approaches to them. Uh, and you want to apply strategies to these offenders. Some of those strategies are quite broad. In other words, not just deterrence in a way involving the community, church groups, and others. Community-based approaches, you want to enhance collective efficacy and community collaboration. You want to enhance the community's ability to do things, to play a role in social control. 
uh, and you also want to enhance their collaboration with police, and you want to develop approaches that will do that, like community policing. Okay, so this is the part I suppose you're interested in hearing about, but so I think you've got a good sense of where we're coming from. Now here are the conclusions. First of all, caution. Uh, I'm gonna give you the conclusions, by the way, uh, you get up and you give a, you know, you show these conclusions in little bullets and in the, in, the, uh, in the report there's, you know, 10 pages about it. Obviously you want to uh, get the broader sense, but I'm trying to summarize that here, but let me just give you some general caveats at the beginning. Uh, almost all the studies we review in this report, and that's what we're doing, reviewing prior research, we're not doing our own research, they're short term. Uh, they look at what happened after a year or six months or sometimes a year and a half. They're not looking at what happened five years later, what happened 10 years later. And we think, the committee thought, that, that was really crucial. But of course, one of the reasons they don't do that is because funders have a very short view. They want their results in a month. You know, They want their results in a short period. Uh, generally, the federal government, NIJ, was only supporting evaluations of two years, which meant generally a year of evaluation, six months development, six months uh, right up afterwards, etc. So uh, impacts we're looking at short term. We don't know what's going to happen 10 years later. Effects are generally local and don't provide in, uh, estimates of jurisdictional impact. What I mean by that is that we're, usually what's happened, and I've been a part of this, and I think it's the right way to go, but it also limits some of the generalizations you can make. So when we look at hotspots policing, we want to know whether you've had an effect on the hotspots. We want to know whether you've had effects on the nearby area. Some programs look at uh, pro uh, Operation Impact, I think it was called in New York, had an evaluation. It looked at the specific community where it occurred. What about the city of New York? If you adopt a strategy like hotspots policing, what kind of effect will you have on the entire city? Right, and that's something that really hasn't been done, or at least not done very much. One area where there's a little more of that is focused deterrence. But when we talk about these effects, we're not necessarily giving the police chief, you will get a 20% decline in crime, you'll spend $10 million, the cost benefit for that is X. And many, I think, police chiefs do want that, and it's something that's very important to do. Maybe you ought to think about those kinds of studies at Vera. Now, another caution has to do with the real world. You guys better than most academic researchers who are only in universities, I think no better. You know in the real world things are messy, right? In the road, the police chief adopts community policing, but then he adds problem solving to it, or they adopt hotspots, but they do problem solving hotspots. In other words, they're not trying to create a completely isolated environment for you to work in. Now, sometimes you get that. I tried very hard in my career to create some of those environments, but it's often very hard. And therefore, sometimes our ability to reach conclusions was clouded by the fact that the real world is messy. Now, part of our job is to try to undo that messiness, and we did try that, but it's something to think about as you think about effects of the program. Okay, so we had a broad uh, conclusion about effects on crime, which I thought I'd say at the beginning. There is sufficient scientific evidence to support the adoption of a number of proactive policing practices, certainly if the primary goal is to reduce crime. Now, I'm going to go into the specifics. Um, the uh, uh, but this could be, uh, I'd say this is your good news, if you like, in sense. That was uh, one of the conclusions that all of these people reached. Let me tell you a little bit about the specifics. Uh, in terms of hotspots uh, policing, uh, we found uh, uh, that there are uh, 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 crime prevention or crime reduction effects. Uh, often uh, there's not displacement to nearby areas. There's often, as a matter of fact, the effects generally go that way a diffusion of benefits to immediate surrounding places. So if you want, if you have a problematic street, the street outside has a lot of crime, if you use hotspots policing, if you send more patrol or other uh, 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 deterrence oriented strategies by the police, you'll get an effect in that place and the areas nearby will get better. Uh, and there are a large number of strong studies. Indeed, uh, in the report we reviewed uh, a number, but now it turns out uh, there's a new report uh, which has something like 70 some odd studies, which is quite a lot in our area. Anthony Bragg is just doing this. Uh, predictive policing, despite all the hype for predictive policing and how this is the next generation and how it's going to be, you know, we're going to know exactly where the next crime is going to occur, uh, there's very little evidence that this actually does anything. There are a few studies, they're mixed, 
Now, there's one study in South America that finds no effect. There's a study in Los Angeles that does find an effect on crime. Uh, the point is that given the cost of these uh, uh, programs that people are from buying from other people, like Treadpole, given the hype about it, given how many newspaper articles, it's surprising we have very little evidence. And the committee reported there were insufficient studies to draw any conclusions about predictive policing, which means that if you were advising a police department, you'd want to say, think a little bit before you run to do that. Make sure this is the right direction. CCTV for passive use, like putting it up in a, uh, a parking area, it seems to have modest reductions in property crime. There's very little evidence to date uh, that uh, if the police sort of use it in an interactive way, they'll have an impact. There's lots going on in this area, by the way. There's in China, I was in China, they're developing artificial intelligence to use CCTV to sort of tell you uh, whether things are leading up to violence. But at the moment, CCTVs are not effective as a crime control study. Uh, problem oriented policing, in terms, uh, that was a place based study, studies, in terms of problem solving. Uh, we find the committee concluded there were crime reduction effects. There aren't uh, as large a number of studies, let's say, as in hotspots, uh, but there are a number of strong studies and a lot of what we would call uh, weaker studies, at least in terms of making causal inferences. Third party uh, policing. Uh, third party policing is a case where you, the police enlist third parties like property owners or uh, store managers to participate with them. Uh, a bar owner, you'd say, you've got to card people, you've got to do this, you should hire someone who will stop the violence before it gets outside, etc. Uh, and they use quite often city ordinances uh, uh, to apply pressure to those, uh, 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 to those third parties. Uh, if you're an apartment owner, you have certain responsibilities. The police come and use uh, uh, agencies to apply pressure to get you to cooperate uh, in terms of reducing problems. That might be better supervision of, uh, of tenants or uh, better entranceway, cleaning up yards that have been uh, used for other purposes, et cetera. Anyway, uh, also crime reduction effects. And again, uh, not a large number of studies, but enough for us to draw a conclusion. What about person-focused studies? Uh, focused deterrence policing, you get, seem to get short and long-term area-wide crime reduction impacts. There are a growing number of studies. By the way, no randomized studies, but the quasi-experiments seem to us to be fairly persuasive. Uh, there's a developing number of studies uh, at the moment. SQFs, uh, unfocused, general citywide, considering that's used by many police departments was to some extent Although there's some controversy about this in New York, uh, it has mixed outcomes. You can't come to a, a real conclusion. SQFs that are focused, for example, on high violent gun streets, those seem to have crime reduction effects. But of course, they might have other effects you want to think about if you're going to bring this type of, of uh, very intensive uh, 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 focus prevention strategy. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. I'm going to go a few minutes over. Okay, what about community-based strategies? Well, community-oriented policing, our conclusion was no consistent crime prevention benefit. Uh, that's concerning to the, I suppose, the cops office, which believes that community policing has uh, crime prevention outcomes, but of course, they also encourage problem-oriented policing, which we found did have problems, uh, uh, crime prevention outcomes. Procedural justice policing. Now, I wanna emphasize that we had two members on this committee who were people who had developed this set of ideas. The conclusion of the committee was that there weren't enough studies, those studies moved in both ways to draw a conclusion. I wanna emphasize something, being unable to draw in a conclusion is not the same as saying it doesn't work. Okay, what that says is uh, the 21st century report, which was for a different purpose and uh, developed out of conversations with community and the police, they very much encouraged uh, procedural justice policing. Now, I think in our report, if you read it, we like the idea too. Shouldn't the police treat citizens with respect? Shouldn't they try to communicate that they're fair? Uh, shouldn't they allow citizens to tell their side of the story? Uh, I think that's a great idea. But don't necessarily hang your hat on crime control because uh, that may not be one of the outcomes. You should be cautious at the moment. At the same time, uh, I would think in democratic policing, those are all good ideas and something to be emphasized. A broken windows uh, policing, 
that's general, aggressive towards whole neighborhoods, for example, uh, there are some small effects we observed and null effects, not a very uh, powerful and persuasive crime prevention approach, especially given the cost of those strategies, other sorts of costs in the community. But we did find that uh, place-based problem solving, in other words, broken windows that was focused on particular streets that had problems, that seemed to have crime reduction effects. Okay. So you've got an idea of what, it seems there are a lot of these programs that have crime prevention effects, but of course an important question is what kind of impacts do they have on American communities? So hotspots policing. Now I think it's important to note there were a number of articles written that suggested that hotspots policing and other focused uh, proactive strategies had negative effects on communities. But we don't find that. We find basically no effects. There's little evidence of harm, or improvement in community attitudes. In other words, community, the community doesn't really respond very much to this. If a police chief thinks he's going to get like, you know, stars from the community for doing hotspots policing, they're going to like him more and there's going to be greater legitimacy. Well, maybe he'll get stars because people like the idea that the street that had a lot of problems may be cleaned up, but it's not going to change perceptions of legitimacy. It's not going to show improvements in evaluation of the police. And I think it's very important to know that you're getting crime control, but that crime control is not leading in those areas to, uh, to improvement. However, there, we don't find evidence that it's leading to some of the negative outcomes that people have argued would come. Predictive policing, insufficient studies, there are insu insufficient studies for crime control as well. And CCTV and CCTV applied uh, uh, both as a passive strategy and as a, a tool for policing uh, uh, there are insufficient studies. You're going to see this over and over again because the truth is there's been a lot more attention to crime control than there have been to community outcomes, which is a problem. In terms of problem-oriented policing, interestingly enough, of the effective strategies that I noted earlier, this is the only one that seems to have a positive impact in the community. And I'll say something about that towards the end in my own analysis of this. Uh, you get uh, consistent small to moderate positive impacts of problem-solving interventions on short-term community satisfaction with the police. Now I'm gonna tell you later that one of the reasons for that is community collaboration. It turns out that most of these problem-solving problems do something to involve the community in what they're doing. They talk to them first, they involve them, they get information from them. And we think, or and I'll, I should say, I think at the end that this is key to understanding what's going on. Third-party policing, again, not, not much evidence. Focused deterrence, really surprising in a way, a program that, that sort of spreads out across the community, identifying the highest rate violent offenders, there's basically little evaluation evidence on whether the community likes it, sees it as positive, whether it increases their perceptions of legitimacy of the police. Now SQF, both unfocused and focused. There are not evaluations that we could find, or strong evaluations that told us about community responses overall. There are a few. Uh, they tend to provide negative outcomes. We weren't, we didn't have a strong evidence base to draw community ideas. However, it's clear that SQFs have negative outcomes on people. In other words, there are lots of these individual studies of kids who are the subjects of SQFs in New York. I'm sure you're familiar with these studies. They've been found health issues, psychological issues, uh, perceptions towards the police, certainly not improving, uh, uh, much more negative feelings of alienation, especially young people. So SQFs overall have had negative uh, personal uh, outcomes to the police, but they didn't, we don't find a community-based outcome. Now, does that mean that there are not community-based outcomes? No, what it means is we don't really have research on that. You have to ask yourself the question, by the way, why is it that we don't have research on that? How could that be? In New York City, for example, when SQFs were being conducted where there are 700,000 a year, were there surveys even to find out, maybe you might know about them in a way that I wouldn't, to find out about those sort of impacts. Okay, uh, conclusions about community-based strategies. Community-oriented policing. Well, there's good evidence that leads to modest improvements in the public's view of policing and the police. And there are a number of strong studies. So community policing, that's what we did in 1985, is a good idea for police uh, managers if they want to improve their relationships with the community and there's solid scientific evidence to show that. Procedural justice. Again, the evidence is limited uh, and we couldn't draw causal conclusions about whether 
procedural justice policing improve community orientation. And I should say about procedural justice, if you think about it, many of the communities that have the strongest concerns of the police are communities that have had problems with the police for generations. This is not new. American policing started with slave patrols, for God's sake. You know, the, the history of American policing and race is abhorrent. Now, over the last 20 years, I think police departments have tried, many of them. There are also 16,000 police departments in America, beware. So you, you, it's hard to generalize, but many departments have tried hard to deal with that legacy. But a legacy of generations of treatment that was unfair and unjust, not everywhere, not all the time, but in many places and in many times, may not be able to be undone with treatment over a month or two months or five months. And I think this is an area we need long-term approaches to see if long-term changes in policing can help change uh, really a history of problems between the police and certain communities. Broken windows policing, uh, interesting enough, broken windows policing developed with the idea of, uh, of working with the community, of the community becoming stronger, of not being so fearful, and yet, uh, at least the studies we have don't show much impact of broken windows policing in the short term on fear of crime or collective efficacy, two outcomes that seem to be important to broken windows policing. All right, race. Now, race is a very difficult problem. Uh, we deal with it in a full chapter, but the chapter doesn't draw many conclusions. It talks about the history of race and policing. It also tries to distinguish a problem this report had which is our report is not about the problems of policing in America, right? It's not about whether policing in America is uh, unjust or in general, if you like. It's about proactive policing. And therefore, sometimes it's hard to distinguish between what proactive policing might do, if you like, and what certain uh, 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 what police do in a sort of general way. So here was our conclusion. The first is there are likely to be large racial disparities in the volume and nature of police citizen encounters when police target high-risk people or high-risk places, as is common in many proactive policing programs. So translating that, and the language of this was put together pretty carefully, when you do proactive policing, you're likely to get a larger proportion of minorities in the poor, for example. If you focus in on hotspot streets, it's more likely the disadvantaged people will be living on those streets. And I should qualify that. A lot of the hotspot streets are shopping streets in the West. But nonetheless, if you focus on hotspots, you'll tend to get overall more. Certainly focus deterrence. If you look for people who have had many contacts with the police, have been in prison before, et cetera, you're likely to come up more often with disadvantaged populations. So it's clear that proactive policing will lead to, if you like, uh, um, uh, greater uh, racial disparity and uh, also socioeconomic disparity. However, policing leads to those disparities in general. Policing as we know it today. Corrections lead to those disparities. 50%, I believe, of the prison population in the United States are African American, are black. And uh, they represent, I believe, only about 13% of the population. Is that right? So 14%. But the point is, that's a really large difference. So it's something you ought to think about. What it does say, what we felt the policy take from that is when you do these strategies, you need to think about how it might disproportionately impact. Uh, communities you're concerned about. The second one was existing evidence does not establish conclusively whether and to what extent the racial disparities associated with concentrated person focused uh, and place based enforcement are indicators of statistical prediction, racial animus, implicit bias, or other causes. In other words, there could be all sorts of causes for that. The New York City Police want to say the cause is that there's more crime in those streets. However, it could be that police agencies that, especially not using as much statistical data, are picking on those streets because certain types of people live there. That could be the cause. But there's, the research on this is incredibly uh, lacking relative to the importance. It's almost, uh, I gave an interview to, to the papers on this, I remember, and I use the term, of, you know, it's, it's startling that there's been so little research on these sorts of questions that are so critical to uh, American policing and American life. And then we say, however, the history of racial justice in the United States, in particular in the area of criminal justice and policing, as well as ethnographic research that has identified disparate impacts of policing on non-white communities, 
makes the investigation of the causes of racial disparities a key research and policy concern. Now, a lot of people are going to say this is a cop-out, right? The problem is, this is a National Academy of Sciences Committee. And you have to reach a certain level of evidence that all these people can agree to. So what we're saying is we need a lot more, a lot stronger evidence. Okay. So key messages of the report as I go over a bit. Now, there is sufficient scientific evidence to support the adoption of many proactive policing practices. Certainly, if the primary goal is to reduce crime, right? I mean, that's an important take from our report, um, unambiguous. Crime prevention outcomes can be obtained without producing negative community reactions. That's very important because look, many of these strategies don't seem to have negative uh, reactions. Don't think they're going to improve evaluation of the police necessarily, but at least you're not going to get uh, necessarily, or you're not going to get in those communities, uh, a collective sense that uh, uh, things got, uh, that we're uh, unhappy with the police about that issue. Let's be careful. Crime prevention outcomes can often be obtained with, oh, I said that. Okay. Uh, some community-based strategies that have little, seem to have little crime prevention impact have begun to show evidence of improving the relationship between the police and the public. Community policing, there's lots of good reasons to participate in community policing from the evidence we saw. And this issue of racial disparities that I spoke about before. Certainly, if we don't have evidence about what's causing it, every police department, every police manager should think about what they're doing. If I do this, this might have this impact. Therefore, what can I do to reduce the possible impact? How can I explain to the community what I'm doing so they understand I'm not trying, I'm, I'm not doing something that's purposely oriented towards over-policing in your community, but rather in helping your community. These are things people have to do. Okay, here's the ending and a little advice on my part that's not in the report. And the question is, can police agencies maximize crime control and community outcomes? Because right at the moment, I think that the, the dialogue in the U.S. is, uh, and I spend a lot of time out of the U.S., so I keep coming back and forth, and the atmosphere here is very difficult at the moment when it comes to policing, right? I mean, it's, it's, you can feel it. People talk about it. Uh, people are often saying things in a very stringent way because there, you know, there's a lot of tension and feelings of problems going on. But, uh, but I think it's very important to say what police ought to be doing. Can they? Can you, improve, can you maximize crime control and can you improve relationships with your communities uh, at the same time? I use, can you have your cake and eat it too? And I, I used that picture in China and they couldn't figure that at all. They said, if you have your cake, you eat it. Why would you have your cake if you didn't eat it, right? <laughs> so yeah, it's interesting. Okay, so quickly look at this. So these are the two strategies that we found the strongest scientific evidence that they have positive community impact. Community policing and problem policing. And what do they have in common? They don't have in common that they're focused on crime control because lots of times uh, community policing is really oriented towards improving uh, community relations and hopefully that will have crime control impact. Uh, does it have positive impact? Both of those do. Does it often have a community engagement component? That's what I said earlier. In other words, problem oriented policing though with the crime, uh, 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 problem solving policing, uh, with, though it's uh, crime control oriented, uh, uh, it usually engages the community. And it seems to me that what we get out of that is that the way to do this, if I was a police manager, I would say, yeah, I may use focused deterrence, I may use hotspot policing or problem oriented policing, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to infuse it with community engagement, uh, which seems to me just a re reasonable logic idea. That should be done because it's not enough, especially in this day and age, to reduce crime. Crime is not the only issue. In New York City, crime rates have gone down so much that I won't say it's not an issue, but it's not the only issue, clearly. The police have a job to reduce crime, but they have a job to do that in a way that communities assent and that will lead communities to evaluate them positively. By the way, don't get me wrong. You don't pay all that money for the police for them to be reviewed positively by citizens. But at the same time, when they do their other roles, whether it's a crowd control, disaster control, responding to calls, uh, reducing crime, uh, reducing uh, 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 nuisances, et cetera, all that should be done in a way that the community assents to and the community leads the community to support their police. And in the long term, it seems to me that that is the best approach and one that will lead to the best long-term outcome. Well, thank you very much. For this.
they are so thankful to you for bringing in, especially your really localized experiences, which are so relevant to many of us here in the room. We have gone over a little bit in time, so if folks need to leave, um, please feel free. But otherwise, I think we'll, we'll stick around if, if you're Absolutely. so willing and take a, a few questions. We'll ask that they please be questions. Um, and uh, please feel free. Any questions from the audience? Can you just speak up a bit? Um, just to restate for the folks who are live streaming with us and weren't able to hear, I, I be believe, and correct me if, if I'm mistaken, but the question was with uh, David's research and other research, are there examples of policing that's more collaborative and involving the community as opposed to police just policing the community in a very unilateral direction? Is that a fair question? Yeah, I mean, uh, we, we have, a, for example, a study, uh, Charlotte Gill and I from Mason, in uh, Seattle, where we organized a crime prevention task force for juvenile hotspots, and the police were not the boss of the task force. Do you know what I'm saying? The community members, uh, different representative community groups, and uh, uh, that seems to have, we're looking at some of the crime prevention outcomes, but at least in terms of a positive relationship with the community, that seems to have worked extraordinarily well. And I will say something interesting, we found that the, the community evaluation of the police improved, even though this was not a, uh, a police run community policing, if you like, event, a community prevention event. So um, look, when police go in with community policing as a kind of manipulative strategy, it seems to me that doesn't work very well. Uh, community policing, the, the community is not dumb. They get it when they're being manipulated and they get it when they're being worked with in a collaborative way. Uh, there are lots of, we have another study in Brooklyn Park where we took patrol officers, you know, patrol officers have about between 25 and 40% of their time free. And so we took that time, we allocated uh, it for them to go and identify people at hotspots, crime hotspots, and to, um, uh, to work with them to improve community relations, improve relations with the police, and also to think about problem solving. And it's, it seems to me those programs work pretty well in terms of those kind of activities. Now, we'll give you what we call a warning. In that program, we found that community fear of crime increased in the experimental group. And the reason for that probably is you have lots of police walking around all the time, and not all that many people are necessarily interacting with them. In other words, they identify a group of people that they tend to, to get involved with. I'm not sure I uh, answered your question, but I think you're, you're onto something that's not about our report but it's about the way in which community policing is being done. The more it's really a community collaboration, the more it's, uh, it's really uh, the police trying to work with the community, respect the community, et cetera, it seems to me that those are gonna fulfill the goals more. But the implications of our work here is you should combine those sort of community-based aspects with other sorts of crime control that have been found to be effective. And that seems to me the, the direction. Someone else over here? Or? You're being punished because you're locally over there. That could be a problem, I think. No, we, we've used the UK. Oh. The, the question was, that with the research studies that were referenced in the NAS report just from the United States, or did they include studies from abroad? No, we utilize studies from Australia, from the UK, from Europe when they were relevant. Majority of the studies were US studies. Or whatever. Yeah. 
Look, the, uh, the National Academy of Sciences develops narrative reviews. You know, I'm very involved in the Campbell collaboration. That's more what we call systematic reviews that would have the kind of approach you're talking about. Uh, we did develop a series of criterion for strength of evidence. But uh, for example, if I was writing a report, uh, so most people would assume that I would suggest that experimental studies should be given greater weight than non-experimental studies. That's not generally, not necessarily true. And the committee's view was that the, uh, that we'd evaluate each study on the, let's call it the believability of the causal inferences, right? Because there were economists and others who had a, a you know, who had a different view of, of what kinds of causal statements would be strong. Uh, the uh, studies were assessed in a sort of narrative way. We would read through the studies, we'd go through them, etc., and we'd draw conclusions about how strong they were. So you had this whole group of people making conclusions about uh, individual studies. At the same time, we did use uh, the Campbell reviews and other reviews as informative. We didn't take them, if a Campbell review said this worked and there's an effect size of that, this committee, even uh, I, two of my reviews are included, with this committee did not say, we accept that. They went through the studies individually, they report the uh, review, et cetera. So you have what's called a more uh, 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 qualitative assessment by the committee members of the strength of the evidence. Well, we can, okay, but I don't mind going over and people can leave. I don't get it. Oh. Regarding how police perceive themselves in the community as law enforcement versus social service agency providers, was if there's studies taken in the county of but that's a great idea. We didn't necessarily focus on it, but I'll give you my focus on it. Oops. Sorry. The question was um, whether or not policing agencies were considered more of a social service. How often they're perceived themselves in the community, whether or not they're seen as social service versus strictly law enforcement. Yeah, I, I don't think we dealt with that. Uh, uh, we dealt with that a great deal. Uh, it's a really good, it's a really good question, and there's been some research, I think, uh, lately. Obviously, when you're doing community policing, you want to leave the, you know, the police officer's warrior idea behind a bit, right? Um, yeah, there's, there's not a lot of, it's a really good idea, uh, and it ought to be integrated, but it's not something we spend time talking about. Thank you. I think you, want to take one more question, or leave Those are hard to hear, but if I can just, let, I'll rephrase and you can tell me if I got it, okay? Is it possible that broken windows did work? I, are you speaking about William Bratton? Okay. Yeah, let me, you know, this is, this is a very tough issue. Let me answer it in two ways. The first, the first way is that uh, if you use a sort of a focused approach to broken windows at a specific street or two, there's evidence you get crime prevention impact. Those crime prevention impacts may be a sort of hotspots policing impact, a deterrent impact. Uh, we didn't find impacts of broadly focused, you know, I was called by, New York, by I think it was the New York Times, about a, a, a situation where a police department that was under scrutiny had said they're doing hotspots policing. What they meant was they were focusing on the entire neighborhood of five square miles and stopping people all over the place. That sort of unfocused policing, if you, if you ask me, not NAS report response to that, well, actually related to their findings, uh, is probably not very effective. But look, the crime outcomes are not the only issue in policing. Uh, you know, in Saudi Arabia, they cut off people's hands uh, as a crime control strategy. 
I don't think we would, even if we knew that that would stop all robberies, I don't think that would be an acceptable mode of operation according to the Supreme Court in the United States. Uh, well, that's not something we're willing to do. In the same way, uh, you know, uh, New York City uh, had 700,000 uh, stop, question, and frisk. And that year I did a study of where those were occurring. And I found that stop, and question, and frisk were highly concentrated at hotspots. In other words, there was an overlap between those two issues. And so and initially the, the New York City Police Department was very happy with me. Uh, but then they weren't so happy when I said, I said, you know, uh, you got to be thinking about uh, stop, question, and frisk in terms of what's going on. Is it reasonable to use a strategy that has such negative effects on the people who have interactions with that strategy and do 700,000 of them? Uh, and you have to understand something like Braden. I don't think stop, question, and frisk is inappropriate all the time. In other words, there are situations, for example, high crime gun markets. Uh, places where people are being shot. I even think you could do that with community collaboration. You come up and you tell people first what you're doing. You explain to them you're stopping people who have, you have to have a bulge or other constitutional requirements, but you're going to do that a lot when it's okay constitutionally because people are being killed you, right? But having a, an approach like stop, question, first, broadly focused across 700,000 people, personal opinion, not NAS report, that strikes me as just wrong. Okay, the, 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 the consequences for the, for the society, for the community, for individuals are wrong. And that's being said by a person, one of the main studies supporting SQFs at a local, uh, having a crime prevention effect at individual streets is a study I did uh, in New York City for the National Academy of Sciences. So uh, my point here is that uh, we need to think about lots of things, but we not, we shouldn't forget crime control. Just a parting comment. Tom Tom and I have a bit of a disagreement at the moment. I, Tom, I love Tom, he's a great guy, wonderful, this, the ideas he has are wonderful. But here's the disagreement we've had a few times. If you read what he's been writing, he says, he said, the primary concern of the police should be community reaction. The primary concern of the police should be, we should use procedural justice as the primary approach because the most important thing now is community reaction. Now, I agree with him, the community reaction is a major issue. But I don't bring police, I don't want to hire police and have a police force just to improve community attitudes towards the police. Indeed, if I don't need a police force, get rid of them. There are lots of things you don't need police force. They don't have to do everything. They don't have to deal with garbage. They don't have to do everything. If I'm going to have a police force, and why am I saying this? Because when you have a police force, you give people guns, you give them sticks, the clubs, right? You give them the right to stop you. I hate being stopped. I don't know about you. Have you ever been stopped, frisked? pulled over in the airport into another room. If you live outside the country in the Middle East, trust me, that happens. I hate that, right? Uh, so I don't want to give these people the right to do it unless I have to. And the only reason I have to in my regard is because of these other functions of police. I'm not going to hire them just so they can feel, I can feel good about them. That is not the purpose in my view of police. Anyway, we're going to have to end, but I'm happy to stick around outside for a few minutes if you like. Thank <laughs> you.